Hello. Morning, everyone. Okay, hope everyone can see and hear me properly. Excellent. So today, uh, we'll try and wrap up our discussion on um, the first new direction that epistemology took in the 20th, uh, 20th century. That is, of course, um, epistemology naturalized. Then we'll move on to feminist epistemology. Uh, so we were talking about natural, natural epistemology in the sort of tradition of Quine versus traditional epistemology. And this slide right here is about where we left off. Well, we left off on the previous one. Um, but uh, in the interest of time, I think we should try and continue and see what the difference is between tradition, uh, traditional epistemology, epistemology as it's traditionally conceived, um, the differences between that and between natural epistemology. Traditional epistemology uh, is causal. We discussed this a little bit last time, right? This is this is um, uh, like, or sorry, natural. I misspoke. Uh, natural epistemology is causal. Like um, the story that it tells is similar to the story that the sciences tell about the natural world. So um, we mentioned this last time. Um, when we approach trying to understand the world with science, um, what we're doing is trying to tell basically a story of cause and effect, something that can causally explain a natural phenomena, something that can identify um, sort of on the more fundamental end laws of nature. Uh, and then from there, theories. Naturalized epistemology also tells a causal story, um, but not about justification, right? Uh, if if you, you could think about traditional epistemology as telling a story, um, you could maybe think about it as, as telling us why our beliefs are justified in the sense that, I don't know, some justification some 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 piece of evidence uh that's well justified causes me to ad adopt a certain belief that that's but that's not really how we think of it um and the reason is that traditional epistemology is usually understood as normative not descriptive but in any case if you think of natural epistemology um it's kind of like science in the sense that science tells this causal story. The example I have in the slides is to do with, you know, um, how I might perceive, I don't know, this book on my desk, right? Our textbook. Light shines on the book, reflects off of its surface, and makes its way to my retina, which makes its way down my optic tract, down to the optic nerves, into the visual cortex, and eventually, after a whole bunch of complicated information processing steps in the brain occur, I perceive a philosophy book on my desk. So um, it could give us natural epistemology, taking this sort of causal scientific approach, um, could give me a step-by-step -step picture of this causal chain, of the chain of events that start in the world and lead um, to my... Um, perception of the book and ultimately to my beliefs about the book being on my desk in this case um this is uh this is a very scientific story um uh it's not very um epistemological in the traditional sense though because it's descriptive not normative and that leads us to our second point about traditional epistemology, and that is that traditional epistemology, as I mentioned a moment ago, is normative. It tells us what we ought or ought not to believe. Um, a natural 
epistemology tells us what we do and don't believe. So it's more like the sciences in that way. If you want to think of it, think of it like this, you know, to unpack this normative distinctive description, you know, think of uh, what logic does versus what psychology does. So logic is the study of proper reasoning. So it identifies rules or norms that if you follow them, you will be reasoning properly. And it also identifies fallacies where if you commit one of these fallacies, you are not reasoning properly. So logic tells you how you ought to reason. But cognitive psychology, for example, uh, tells us how we actually do reason. And it identifies things like cognitive biases, you know, things where we kind of, our reasoning kind of goes askew. It doesn't say anything about not succumbing to those where you just get people into the lab, Ooh. give them a problem, see what they do with it, um, and identify how people are actually reasoning their way through this particular problem, right? So uh, this whole normative descriptive, uh, descriptive distinction, is, um, you know, if you think of um, traditional epistemology as, as normative, um, uh, all of this is related to the is ought problem, which was identified by David Hume. You know, just because something is the case, does that mean it ought to be that way? Uh, a question that's certainly relevant um, in all of our lives, I think. Um, so that's that's the difference. Um, naturalized epistemology tells a causal story, and it is um, it is descriptive as well, unlike traditional epistemology, which is normative. And this opens the door to Jaguan Kim's criticism of naturalized epistemology. So if science is all about painting these causal pictures, um, that's great. But science, according to Kim, is not something that's meant to answer a question like, should we count these particular scientific beliefs as justified? That's not really what science is all about. Science is about um, telling the causal story, not telling us whether we're justified in believing it. For Kim, uh, you know, as we discussed last time, um, there's, uh, how do I put this? You know, there's a, the, a, an important aspect of traditional epistemology is that it occurs prior to the sciences, right? And Quine uh, says, no, like the epistem epistemology should be part of the sciences. And Kim says, well, well, well hang on, hang on. If we, if we do it like this, it's not epistemology anymore. So um, the causal story that science is supposed to tell is not the story of justification. And traditional epistemologists are interested in justification. You know, when are we justified in holding the beliefs that we do? Hume, uh, similarly, in a similar vein to Kim, um, doesn't think that causal relations are justified are justificatory relations, right? And because uh, because there's nothing uh, necessary about effects following causes. Right, it's just that constant conjunction we observe. We saw this when we were looking at the uniformity principle. Right, if we if we tried to rely on if we tried to justify our belief that the future will resemble the past, because in the past it turned out that the future resembled the past, that would be circular, right? So uh it's that that can't justify the beliefs that we hold sure we're naturally inclined to hold them but the fact that certain effects follow certain causes you know the causal story uh doesn't justify our holding any of the beliefs that we do so for for hume but um i want to focus more on kim here um these uh, relations, these justificatory relations between our different beliefs, you know, whether you're a foundationalist or a coherentist, this is what characterizes epistemology. A naturalized epistemology, Kim says, kind of gives up 
on um, explaining how our beliefs are justified. Kim, Kim is basically arguing that um, epistemology that is not normative, that doesn't tell me, that doesn't explain the justification and thereby doesn't tell me what I ought or ought not to believe, is not epistemology. What do we think? I mean, thinking about what we learned last time and what we've begun talking about today. I don't know. Do we see epistemology like as essentially something that ought to be um, that ought to provide justification for our beliefs to tell us when we are justified, when we have a true belief, when it's justified or can epistemology be more like a science? I have to admit that, um, you know, there is something pretty appealing about Kim's criticism here. I mean, Kim seems to have identified something that, yeah, it seems that that uh, that that seems is essential uh, to to epistemology. As you know, if epistemology is supposed to be epistemology, um, we can't forget about that uh, normative element. <laughs> fair, fair. No, I mean. Yeah, I mean, it is awfully early. I mean, 10, 10 a.m. is still early for doing philosophy, but we'll do our best. Yeah, Chloe, that's true. I agree. I think they both have a point. I think they both play a role at different times when we need it, almost. Yeah. It's like... To have knowledge and to believe that we have the knowledge, we do need to have that belief and trust in our belief that what we know is right. Yeah. And we also need that science piece and our senses in getting to that point. Yeah. I mean, we can see, I think, a little bit of how they complement one another uh in these responses that we're about to take a look at yeah chloe uh, uh, chloe that's a good point like like it's like quine is just saying well let's turn epistemology into a science and so that's very different from traditional epistemology which is prior to the sciences and which is normative right so would epistemology be like the hypothesis or the thought that you have that you want to try and prove? And that's where the science comes in? Yeah. Like, let's 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 continue and um, we'll see if we can um, see if we can make this connection. Right. That some of you are sort of uh, some of you are gesturing at. Um well, Quine actually thinks that science is normative, not just descriptive, right? So what does he mean? Well, it's the scientific method that actually tells us what we ought to believe, right? We're justified, Quine thinks, in believing things that we arrive at via this method. Um, and of course, science um, arrived at the scientific method empirically. Um, you know, science is something we figured out how to do. Um, by doing it, not by sitting in the armchair, not by a priori reasoning. So um, a little bit of this history, um, just before, uh, well, let's get to the chat first. Uh, Kara says, I think that epistemology is a framework for asking questions about knowledge and that trying to bar ideas because they don't fit our idea of what something should be means that we lose out on cool new ideas. Both benefit, both mindsets have benefits. <laughs> Yeah, certainly. Oh, oh, pardon me. So, um, um, if you look at the history of science, right? Science used to be, uh, when we called it natural philosophy at any rate, um, science used to be basically just observing and then reasoning about your observations. So if you think of somebody like Aristotle, right, an early, um, uh, basically an, a natural philosopher, we could call Aristotle a scientist. Um, 
in a certain sense. Uh, so Aristotle sitting by his lagoon, observing the frogs and the fish, the birds and all of the creatures, looking at the plants and kind of looking and seeing how everything fits together. Like, oh, the, the insects are there and they feed the frogs. The frogs feed the fish and the and the birds. So everything's kind of there. Everything's got its own purpose in this little ecosystem. Um, Aristotle was also, uh, you know, uh, into um, really into vivisection as a method of study. So, um, well, this is a little gruesome, but essentially live dissections of creatures to see how things work in there, uh, in the body. Um, so lots of observation and lots of reasoning about what you observe, um, but no experiments, right? No verifying or trying to falsify anything. So then slowly we get to, uh, many, many years later <laughs> over the centuries, we get to positivism, which is a movement in the philosophy of science that says what we ought to do is verify claims. So we're, we try to construct scenarios where we verify our hypotheses. Yeah, yeah. Alive and awake. So, you know, if Aristotle wanted to know about frogs, he wouldn't um, construct an experiment to tell us about frog behavior. Rather, he would inspect the insides of the frog uh, and w watch the heart beating, watch the lungs pumping and, you know, this kind of thing. It's quite uh, yucky, right? <laughs> um, like we can imagine, well, maybe we don't want to imagine early onset. Well, I mean, Aristotle was doing this as an older fella. See, Aristotle was a student of Plato, and after spending a lot of time, I guess, in the classroom, Aristotle, as a as a wealthy, you know, he was a wealthy person, so he did not have to work. Um, he decided, let's get out of the armchair, and let's go out into nature, and let's see how nature works. Um, so Aristotle is, among other things, the first zoologist right? The first person to study living creatures in this way, in an empirical way. Um, but Aristotle is not worried about the suffering he's causing. You know, Aristotle would have said that these creatures can feel. He would have said that they have um, vegetative and sensitive souls. So the sensitive souls would have enabled them to feel, to sense things. But he's not worried about it. <laughs> so, yeah. So we get from that, from, from like ancient Greek science, uh, eventually we get to like the, um, I think probably around the 18th, 19th centuries in Europe, and we get positivism. Which is a movement in science as well as philosophy where we try and verify claims. And then finally, when we get to the 20th century, we get modern science and we get um, we get the work of a philosopher of science named Karl Popper, who pointed out that what we actually ought to be doing and what scientists are in general doing is not verifying, but trying to falsify. So when you do a science experiment, you're not trying to prove a, hypo a hypothesis correct. You're actually trying to disprove it. And if you fail to do that, and if everyone else fails to do that, you can be pretty confident that you, um, that you that you've come to know something, right? And we worked out that positivism was better than natural philosophy, and that um, modern science was better than positivism by doing the science, right? Uh, and and by trying to do better science. Another example from the book is um, a double-blind trial in medicine, right? Say I want to test out the efficacy of a new drug. You know, I've got a drug for some disease, 
and I want to see how it works. Well, I'm going to have to take a bunch of people with that disease, and I got to break them into two groups. There's going to be my control group, which only gets a placebo, and then there's going to be my experimental group. They get the medicine. So neither group of participants know what they're getting. But here's the thing. The doctor who shows up to give you the pill also doesn't know what they're giving you. So if the patient asks, hey, doc, am, which group am I in? Am I in the control or the experimental group? The guy giving you the pill, he doesn't know. Uh, why? Well, because we've learned that if the researcher knows what he or she is giving you placebo or medicine that can also influence the results of the study. So we have to do this in a way where neither the experimenter nor the participants know what condition they're in. <laughs> yeah, very good. Yeah, this is, this is uh, we do this, we do this to try and mitigate the placebo effect, which is real um, and also um, experimenter bias. And yeah, like April says, giving giving unintentional cues. That's right. This is a big problem. I I, I don't so much focus on um, medicine and bioethics and so forth, but um, in the in the dead discipline known as parapsychology, where um, parapsychologists would try and investigate claims of the paranormal this was also a huge problem so for example we've done double blind studies on people who claim to be using uh some kind of paranormal ability to divine uh or or uh, to to divine something like dowsing or tarot cards or a ouija board we've done it with um people who claim to be um you know, using ESP. And when we use double blind studies, we find that really there's nothing there. And that's the reason why parapsychology declined is because um, it, it, it's, it, it's been decades of a lot of null results. And when we do get an interesting result, um, the effect sizes are small and they're very difficult to replicate. So, So we learned all of this by actually doing science. We learned that there's a better way to do science by doing science. Maybe we're not justified in believing um, something that we've arrived at via a bad method, like Aristotle, right? Aristotle, I'm not trying to, um, you know... Um, not trying to be all like, oh, Aristotle, what a dummy, you know. <laughs> he certainly was not. He, but he was a man of his time and circumstances and um, uh, founded all kinds of, uh, of, of, of disciplines which are now full, fully-fledged sciences. Uh, you know, he was not just an important philosopher. He was a political scientist. He was a, a, a zoologist or a biologist. He wrote about meteorology and geology. There was really nothing that Aristotle did not write about, that did not think about. But because of the limitations of the methodology he used, he came to some very odd conclusions, like that the Earth was at the center of the universe, um, that um, life came from non-life, You know, the ancient Greeks were aware that if you left some a piece of old food out, eventually you would start to see maggots, right? Now, Aristotle, just by observing and thinking, reasoned that what was going on is that the organic material, usually meat, is turning into new life. So if you leave an old piece of rotten meat out there and there's maggots in it, it's because the meat is transforming, the dead meat is transforming into something living. Now, he could have done an experiment. He could have left some 
meet in an open jar and one in a closed jar and seen what happens. And he would have seen that flies are laying their eggs on the meat. And uh, that explains where the maggots are coming from. But Aristotle didn't do that. 20% algae, algae, oh, geez. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Or Twinkies. Twinkies are another one. Yeah, too busy, too busy vivisecting all the frogs, right? So yeah, Aristotle, you know, um, certainly got us started uh, in a lot of ways. But, you know, now nobody... You know, we don't believe in Aristotelian physics anymore. Like, why do why do heavy objects go down? Um, well, because that's where they want to go, right? Like, for Aristotle, all things have an end or a telos. So why does the rock fall when I drop it? Well, because the telos or end of a rock is to be down. You know, you've never seen a rock go up, have you? Nope. They obviously want to go down. That's their telos. And everything has a telos. So the insects in the lagoon are there to feed the frog. The frogs feed the fish and the birds. And also allow Aristotle to do his vivisections, apparently, right? Um, we learned that... You know, this is not the right way to do it, and we aren't really justified in believing the results of such a methodology. So we can say that science, um, this is what we call bootstrapping, like science boosts bootstraps uh, itself such that it can inform us what beliefs are justified and unjustified. And this comes from the phrase of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. Like, you know, if imagine if you were stuck in the mud and I just said, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And you could, you were somehow able to just pull yourself out of the mud by pulling up on your shoes. I mean, that's silly. You can't get out of the mud that way. Uh, but that's kind of what science is doing, is pulling itself up by its bootstraps. Um, getting better and better and better over time. Um, and as science gets better, it tells us what beliefs we are justified in believing in. So I'm not justified in believing Aristotelian physics, but I am justified in believing the results of modern physics because it's a much, much better method because it has the armchair or perhaps chalkboard aspects, but it also has experimental aspects. It has theoretical and experimental aspects. So that's what Quine would say. Um, others might say that the normative elements of natural epistemology could depend on natural processes or properties. So, um, there might be, uh, kind of like in the vein of Alvin Goldman's reliable, reliableism, there might be reliable natural belief forming processes that we can identify as good as opposed to poor. And as long as we're using good, reliable ways of arriving at knowledge and not bad ways, um, then we could say, okay, um, there are some, there's still some normativity in natural philosophy, and um, we could count some of these normative properties as as uh, natural. Uh, so recall reliableism, right? Um, we we arrive at the truth, uh, true beliefs via some reliable belief forming process and um science is a reliable belief forming process and science can tell us which belief forming processes are reliable and which are not right science can tell us uh whether one is like whether people uh, whether and how people succumb to misinformation right I mean, think of a reliable belief forming process. A reliable belief forming process might be um, reading a science textbook. Like you're at university. I, for some reason, I guess it's because I teach philosophy of mind. I tend to get a lot of psychology and cognitive science majors in this class. Um, so if you're in, you know, you're studying for your for your for your class. Um, you're reading your psychology textbook or your cognitive science textbook, and um, it's telling you something we've arrived at via science. 
you're probably justified in believing it, right? Because it was arrived at at a belief, uh, arrived at at a reliable, via a, a reliable belief forming process. And we know it was reliable because science told us so. Yeah, COGSI represent. My PhD is in cognitive science. So, you know, you get those scientists that are all like, ooh, philosophy, what? Well, actually, you can be both. I have to wear, I have to, I have to, I sit in the armchair and I also wear the lab coat. Um, whoop, here's my large hat. So, no. Oh. So, yeah. Um, you know, there's a difference between that, you know, believing something you've read in your science textbook. And yes, I know that textbooks change. Sometimes we find out that we were wrong, right? How do we find out that we were wrong about a particular scientific finding? Science, right? So science self-corrects. That's what I mean by bootstrapping, right? <laughs> yeah, cats are all over the place these days. Um, so like psychology tells us uh how people arrive at their beliefs by giving us a sort of information processing account of how we do so especially cognitive psychology which is all about information processing models of human cognition <laughs> this is something we do a posteriori not a priori Now, Goldman's approach is quite different from Quine's, but it's still natural epistemology. I mean, yeah, I get it. I mean, psychology can certainly help us identify reliable belief-forming processes. It can tell us why we ought to trust what is in our science textbook and not trust memes on social media, right? But it doesn't, it still doesn't really give you the ought. Well, that's exactly right. Like, Chloe, that's that's a good point. I would say in that case, it's up to science. Like, science has these sort of course correcting mechanisms, but they're not instant, right? So when Andrew Wakefield um, faked all of his data in the MMR vaccine study and linked vaccines to autism, um, that was initially published. It, it made it through peer review. But then after a while, certain other scientists who were experts said, hang on, something's up here. And after a further investigation, it was revealed that, you know, of course, he had fudged all those numbers. So the paper was then retracted. So the journal that it was published in, The Lancet said, we made a mistake publishing this. This should never have been published, and we're and we're withdrawing this. So it's no longer uh, science, right? It's not worth. It's not worthy of that name. Unfortunately, um, you know, as Crumley says in the book, um, <clears throat> you know, by that point, a lot of people uh, already believed. Um the results of Wakefield's study and still do. I mean, you can draw <clears throat> a more or less, you know, a pretty straightforward causal chain <clears throat> from Wakefield's fraudulent study to COVID vaccine skepticism, which we're all recently familiar with. You know, uh, during the pandemic, there were claims that uh, the mRNA vaccines, for example, would alter your DNA, which uh, is not how they work. It's important to get that out there. They they do not work that way. Um, yeah, that's right. And the 5G towers somehow being connected to COVID and the vaccines, like, you can draw that causal chain from Wakefield to, yeah, Bill Gates and the chips, and y y there's a causal chain there. So which should I ought, 
which which ought I believe and which ought not I believe, right? I mean, I, I still don't think psychology fully tells, fully gives us the ought. Right? Like, even if you say, oh, but we can see that, you know, these people saw, I don't know, memes on Facebook and believed them. And that's causally how they came to believe these claims about the vaccine. But they shouldn't have believed them. Why? What? Why should they not have believed them? You still need, uh, like, we don't quite have the normative uh, part of the story that we want, right? Not yet, anyway. Anyway, maybe some of you will be more or less sympathetic to one of the following options. You know, when it comes to how traditional epistemology and uh, naturalized epistemology can be related to one another, we have three options. Replacement naturalism, substantive naturalism, uh, or cooperative naturalism. And these are all due to Richard Feldman. So what is replacement naturalism? We can replace on replacement naturalism uh, uh, traditional epistemology. We replace it with some kind of empirical science or combination of empirical science. And that's Quine's position, right? Like, let's completely naturalize epistemology. Let's make epistemology um, a natural science so that it's not prior to the sciences. It's still normative. Quine would argue, but it's no longer prior to the sciences. It's part of the sciences. Or we could do substantive naturalism. So this says that epistemic properties are actually a part of the natural world. So being justified is traceable to some kind of fact or some kind of property out there in the world. And this is what Alvin Goldman's reliabilism seems to be. Um, sorry, April, for which, which one? For replacement, would that be going from like normative to descriptive, right? Normative ought and then descriptive being what is like the facts? Well, well, Quine would say it's still normative because the scientific method, um, helps us identify what we ought to believe in. Okay. So, so epistemology is no longer an a priori endeavor, but it is still normative, according to Quine. Okay. It's like descriptive. It's a little bit of both for Quine, you know, because it it works like a science. So it describes how we come to form beliefs. And based on that, uh, we can work out which beliefs we're justified in having you know, depending on how we arrived at them. Okay. And uh, likewise with substantive naturalism. Uh, there's a lot of overlap, you know. It's not like these are all straightforwardly different. There is quite a lot of overlap between some of these two, right? And then there's also cooperative naturalism, um, where um, epistemology is still autonomous from the sciences. Um, questions concerning um, the oughts right, and the justification are still epistemological questions, not scientific questions. But, and this is the one I think a lot of you will probably be quite sympathetic to, um, an epistemologist is still going to read the psychology papers, as it were, right? She will still keep up with the, the results of psychology, neuroscience, and uh, all of these uh, empirical sciences that study the human mind, and that might influence uh, the development of ep epistemological theories. So epistemology on this view is normative. It is not part of the sciences, like on Quine's view, but it gets along with the sciences. It needs the sciences, and the sciences need epistemology. So um, <clears throat> that's why it's cooperative. <laughs> so what do you think? While I uh, re-up on the coffee, what do we think? Are you a replacement naturalist, substantive naturalist, or a cooperative naturalist? Or maybe you're undecided. That's okay as well. Yes.
Coffee, coffee, coffee. Thanks, more coffee. Ah. Ah. Okay. Nobody has decided in the chat. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm sympathetic to aspects of all three. I think it would depend on what it is I'm thinking about and what it is I'm encountering or like situational, you know? Okay. Um, so can you, can you cl clarify with an example, like of something where you might want one approach versus the other? Um, so replacement, when I think about replacement, I think about, um, you know, maybe I have a view or something that I'm kind of, I've got one thought, right? Like that's kind of where my mind is made up, but I've been presented with facts that kind of veer my direction. Do you know what I mean? Like replacing one belief with another? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because, because well well just keep in mind I mean yeah I think that that in itself is an important belief forming process but right. just keep in mind that the replacement concerns replacing the whole of traditional epistemology rather than individual beliefs right okay so, like, so if I'm a replacement naturalist I'm like Quine and I think okay let's get out of the armchair and let's just do the science. Um, and that'll be epistemology. Um, right. and yeah, like, like Chloe says, that is quite extreme. Jonah and Kara like, uh, well, Kara likes the third. Jonah likes the second one. I don't know, Chloe. Um, I'm not an epistemologist. Do you know who you would want to ask is, uh, Professor David Matheson. Um, he's an epistemologist and, uh, and a real good one at that. So he'd probably know better than if you, if you, I don't know if you're kicking around the department or if you have another philosophy class with him at some point, he would be the, he would be the guy that you want to ask about that. Um, I think that Quine is, uh, you know, he, he says this stuff and then, uh, other people respond and through this sort of dialectical process, we arrive at the other two which are substantive and cooperative so um and some of you seem to like substantive and some like cooperative i really like i suppose there's elements of all of uh, of all of these that i kind of like but cooperative naturalism seems the most reasonable to me um you know and i always say <clears throat> maybe i say this because i'm 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 a by training a philosopher and a scientist but I mean, I think to do really good philosophy nowadays, you've got to be empirically informed, right? You cannot just sit in the armchair and think and come to some conclusion and think you'll be justified. Like you have to, you have to be in touch with, with, with what science has revealed about ourselves and the natural world. And any scientist worth their salt needs to be aware, aware of these philosophical questions, right? Of of epistemological questions and metaphysical questions, because you cannot claim to have you cannot claim to be building knowledge and and not have any idea what knowledge is. You cannot be painting a picture of reality without having some fundamental assumptions about the nature of reality. So, like, look, science and philosophy are not enemies, and they're there to complement one another. Uh, especially, I think, in this case, for our purposes, you know, it's especially true of epistemology. Yeah. You know, that's why I, I mean, that's why, uh, like, uh, just before we, we move on to feminist epistemology, this is kind of my beef with Neil deGrasse Tyson, right? Like, I mean, not like I know the guy, I don't. Um, but whenever he's asked about philosophy, you know, he's an astrophysicist and knows all about space and everything. But but you ask him about philosophy and he thinks it's all, you know, sitting around asking, you know, whether we hear sounds if 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 
you know, whether there's a sound of a tree falls in the forest or something. And it's like, dude, come on. Like, could you be any less charitable? Um, uh, and his mentor, Carl Sagan, knew better. <laughs> so. And it's unfortunate that, that a lot of scientists seem to have, have this idea about philosophy. I mean, I don't want to pick on Neil deGrasse Tyson. Stephen Hawking during his life said the same thing. He said basically philosophy is over. Richard Dawkins uh, doesn't seem to think there's there's much for philosophy to do, even though in his actual work as a philologist, I mean, there are plenty of normative questions there. Um. So those scientists that think philosophy is over, I think, don't understand what philosophy actually is. You know, we're not enemies. All right. Feminist epistemology. I can skip this preamble. Um, basically, the preamble just says, um, you know, because... In the history of uh, philosophy, um, women have kind of, uh, well, as with <laughs> all, most other aspects of life, you know, women have been marginalized. So I want to hear from all of you. I want to hear from the ladies. But I'm already getting so much good discussion um, from all of you that I don't think I need to tell you this uh, because... Because everybody's already contributing in, to the discussion in such a thoughtful way um, so far in this class. So let's keep it up. Um, so Cartesian epistemology, as we've seen, imagines the knower as rational, dispassionate, you know, free of emotion, um, can kind of stand apart from the world. And use reason and understand it. I mean, arguably, this goes back to the Greeks, you know, who thought that we could use logos or reason and our mind, our intellect, nous, to stand apart from the ordered whole of existence. That is the cosmos. And we could use logos to understand the ordered whole of existence. So it's it's, it's older than this, but... Which perspective is that? The Cartesian one? Uh, no, I mean. Well, uh, it, oh, feminist. Yeah, I, I think this is actually quite important. It doesn't mean that we should do away with. Oh, hello. It doesn't mean we should do away with. Um, some of the tenets of traditional um, epistemology, but it's kind of like natural epistemology. It, it it does work as a very successful critique of the traditional side of things. So, um, so this idea that we are supposed to be emotionless, reasonable, just you know, knowers, um, feminist philosophers think this is wrong. Uh, science is not actually, science and, uh, isn't actually practiced this way. And believing that it is can actually be, uh, harmful. Um, so when feminist epistemology critiques science and traditional epistemology, it's usually concerned with, um, you know, the way we understand, uh, the way we, we have understood what reason is what objectivity is and um the place of reason in the sciences it has this privileged place which you know i'm not saying it should not have um but sometimes scientists get this picture of themselves as if they're like super rational completely reasonable not affected by emotion or bias at all and that's just not true I mean, that's why we need the scientific method in the first place. I'll give you an example. Oh, April, go ahead. Uh, I think it could, like motivation, is that kind of what you're alluding to within that as well as motivation, right? Because there's some sciences that, you know, like um, research in cancer, right? 
people are drawn to certain parts of science because of personal experience yeah. or high emotions, right? Sometimes we get emotional about something and we start thinking about what it is or we want to make a change in some way, shape or form. Our yeah. thoughts are formulated and based from the emotions that we have. Our reactions, however, can show how full of emotion we are, right? So, like, yeah. I don't think we can be completely emotionless. We're driven by emotions. Yeah, exactly. And 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 I I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but the emotions are there. There is a reason we evolved emotions. They're not, they don't all, like, the traditional picture would have us believe that emotions always make us less reasonable, and that is just not true, right? So, um, but we'll get there. You're absolutely right, but we'll get there. But I'll give you an example, and this is like, uh, this is kind of cringe, right? Um, so, uh, a tri uh, the trigger warning content warning because this example has to do with alleged sexual assault so lawrence krauss i hope i don't get sued um but lawrence krauss right physicist uh does a lot of popular science stuff um actually a, an alumnus of uh carleton university um has had uh credible um allegations made against him so allegedly he has um behaved untoward uh you know toward certain people yeah kai i'm really trying to remember to say allegedly here um you know it's 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 gone so bad i don't think uh, you know charges have never uh, been laid but he's been banned from certain institutions like the perimeter institute in waterloo um, because of these alleged cases of misconduct. Um, and when confronted, uh, he, oh God, what a slimy son of a bitch. He says, uh, oh, uh, I'm a scientist. So, um, you know, there needs to be evidence for a claim. And there's no evidence for these claims for my sexual assault. And I'm a scientist. And it's just like, ugh. Like, come on. Like, what a bad faith argument if I have ever heard one. So, I mean, reason and objectivity do not hold. Like, don't, like, come on, dude. Like, ah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, he's not the only one. I mean, uh, well, it was around the time of the Me Too movement that 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 this came out, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, there is testimony from people who were affected. Um, I think if you want to read read about it, you can you can read a lot about it on P. Z. Meyer's uh, blog. Um, oh yeah, that's right, Kaya. Yeah, so uh, a bit of a red flag. Bit of a red flag right there. So, you know, I don't know what he allegedly did or didn't do. But, you know, here's here's a, a you know, an alleged assault on a, upon a person who then says, hey, this guy did this. And then, uh, oh, well, uh, you know, uh, testimony and anecdote is not reliable evidence. Um, you need, uh, scientific evidence? Like, come on. Come on. That's what feminist epistemology is really worried about. When reason takes this super privileged position, um, sorry, no. Reason is great, it, but so are the emotions. So is the reliable testimony of people that have been wronged or hurt, Right? Ooh, his quote, ew. Kai has got his quote here. As a scientist, I always judge things on empirical evidence, and he always has women ages. Ooh, no, 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 no. Yeah, but no, he doesn't always have 
where he didn't always have women. Ugh. Oh. Yeah, I didn't see it, so it didn't happen. Well, he could be. I mean, he could just be lying. He could have just been lying about that. I don't know. I don't know what he knew or didn't know. I just think it's a real slimy, bad faith argument to say like, oh, uh, sorry, I've got to be a scientist on this one. As opposed to believing, you know, the credible testimony of these um, alleged victims. So. Don't be a Lawrence Krauss, okay? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty slimy. And that leads us to another concern for feminist epistemology, androcentrism, seeing things from a male-centered point of view, essentially, ignoring the perspectives of, uh, of other genders, particularly women, although feminism does include, uh, you know, trans, uh, trans rights, uh, the rights of gender non-conforming individuals, non-binary individuals, you know, feminism is not a, just strictly about women, right? Um, and I think that's, that's important. Um, you know, because that's a source of, uh, of one of those bad faith critiques of feminism is that, oh, well, oh, a feminist, a, eh? uh, well, what about, what about my rights as a man? Well, feminism is about equality of the sexes. It's not about, it's not about, it's not like doing a reverse androcentrism and instead of men being dominant, we'll make it so that women are now dominant and women run the show. No, it's about equality of the sexes. Um, or I should say equality of the genders um, because sex is a bit too binary. So yeah, that's what it's really about. Yeah, April, good point. Um, yeah, feminism tends to be quite intersectional. So, you know, feminists will also consider uh, not just sex and gender, but uh, but race and ethnicity, um, class, disability, right? And now I'm getting a bit outside of my wheelhouse right now, but but I just want to kind of acknowledge this um, because there are there are people who misunderstand feminism i think sometimes intentionally misunderstand it and and that is not going to be happening here yeah all the isms right they all kind of do this so yeah feminism um and you know feminism again has evolved uh started i think uh arguably with mary wollstonecraft And a vindication of the rights of women. Mary Wollstonecraft was Mary Shelley's mom. Mary Shelley would go on to write Frankenstein. But, you know, Mary Shelley also thought that uh, slavery was fine. Yeah, four waves, that's right. And, you know, then we get into uh, women's suffrage, right? So women wanting the right to vote, you know, votes for women and everything. Uh, and, of course, the Second World War was big because all of the men were off fighting. And uh, uh, women did have uh, wartime roles, like, but they were typically relegated to administrative or uh, medical roles. Also roles in intelligence. I mean, this is a time, you know, during the Second World War where computer was still largely a job description not a device and most computers were women so people doing sums uh they were they were mostly women um you know then you get to the 1960s and you've got the birth control pill and you know it's about bodily autonomy um uh i think into the 1970s um you know, uh, abortion access and, and those kinds of things. Um, yeah. Extreme feminism. There is a radical, there is radical feminism, but radical feminism says, uh, not only do we have to sort of be aware of the patriarchy and have equality between the sexes, we also need to dismantle the patriarchy, which isn't even really that radical. <laughs> like, I mean, maybe it's radical compared to Mary Wollstonecraft, but yeah, getting rid of the patriarchy, it, I don't know, sounds fine. I'm okay with that. Um, 
Oh, the starlings are really having a time of it at my bird feeder today. Uh, sorry, I get distracted by the birds. Okay, where are we? Yeah, Kaya, good point. And people, I mean, I think you see this. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Oh, that's disappointing. I just went and put it up. I didn't ask. Um, actually, my partner found it. It was lying on the ground somewhere. It was a really nice double suet feeder. She picked this. She picked it up. She's like, look what I found. I was like, that's sick. Now I have starlings, cardinals, house sparrows, woodpeckers, chickadees, nuthatches. Did I say blue jays? Blue jays? Uh, once there was a pigeon. And of course, those damn squirrels. And one time there was a Cooper's hawk in the tree outside of my apartment, but he wasn't interested in the bird feeder. I think rather uh, the birds themselves. Okay, so enough about birds. Yeah, the squirrels. But you know, the crazy thing, just to continue this tangent, is that now there is a little... So over the summer, there's been a family of gray squirrels. So there's been a mom and, and three little babies that have been growing up in the tree. And now they're grown up and they're kind of going off to find their own trees. But there's been this little red squirrel that's been showing up, putting the run to the gray squirrels, which are much larger. Um, but the red squirrel is more aggressive. Um, and it's been chasing them all out of the tree. <laughs> yeah, dear wild turkeys we get a lot of wild turkeys around ottawa i'll share some maybe some of my bird photography one day because I, I like to go down to the river and photograph the birds and there's a lot of interesting a lot of interesting creatures around here sometimes you even see foxes uh and and stuff in the city i once saw i was taking the dog for a walk and there was a fox this and it wasn't at night it was just in the getting close to the evening but there was a fox being harassed by crows, by a group of crows. And they were dive bombing this fox, taking turns, harassing it. So I guess maybe it had, the fox had found something that the crows didn't want it uh, to see. Maybe a nest, maybe food. But they were chasing away this fox. And I thought, well, that is really neat. That is really cool behavior. Yeah. Foxes, bears, yeah. Yeah, murder of crows. <laughs> okay so our common sense notion of science we call or um philip kitcher calls the legend so when we use science to produce knowledge that's guided by reason obviously science is an individual enterprise you know it's uh it's done by individual scientists. Um, science is a sort of fundamental knowledge enterprise. And science leads us to objective truths. Those are some uh, features of our common sense notion of science. Uh, scientists are realists about their scientific findings. They believe that there is actually an objective reality out there that science can tell us about. Uh, and science and reason are important. Uh, they're like this. They're buddies. Um, science is also supposed to be value-free, which I think is a highly questionable claim. So this is the legend. Um, reason and objectivity rule. And these commitments um, are what feminist philosophers are critiquing. And keep in mind, critiquing doesn't mean... You know, just like, ah, get rid of this. Uh, it means to analyze, right? And try and understand. Uh, maybe there's a better way. Maybe through a critique we can um, come to understand science a little better. Come to see what, what some of its drawbacks might be. Um, 
Well, Kitcher is 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 describing is like, look, the, he's he's uh, he's just painting this picture for us. But it's the feminist epistemologists uh, that are really doing the critiquing here. So I want to answer Jonah's question. Um, is the actual way knowledge is defined and justified affected by emotions? Um, yes, it can be. Certain certain feminist epistemologists would say that. They would say, like the example somebody gave, um, you know, let's say you go to medical school and you decide to study you know, how to come up with a cure for cancer because you're, you, somebody important to you died of cancer, right? Um, I mean, obviously your emotions are going to be at play in such a situation and that's not a bad thing, right? Um, in fact, I think scientists probably should be passionate about what they study right earlier i was kind of ripping on neil degrasse tyson for not understanding why philosophy is so important but have you ever seen neil degrasse tyson talking about space he's so passionate about it he's like you know if you tell him like why is pluto not a planet if okay so pluto is a dwarf planet. He does he he talks with his hands a lot. You ever notice that like so Pluto is too small to be a planet, right? He is so passionate about that stuff. Um and that's a good thing about Neil deGrasse Tyson and that's a thing that I think more scientists, you know, I I'm happy when I see a passionate scientist, right? So <clears throat> but yeah, I like how he I like how he talks with his hands and gets excited. I like how he has outer space themed neck neckties. These are good things. We want our scientists to be passionate, I think. But anyway, objectivity. Let's talk about objectivity. One dimension of objectivity is epistemic, right? And this is um, what Crumley calls point of view independence. It's the view from nowhere idea. We all have our own subjective point of view, but science is supposed to be objective. It's supposed to tell us about the world from no one's point of view. So that's the view from nowhere. And this is important, I think, when it comes to perhaps the very fundamental sciences, like physics, right? Like in physics, you want to come up with laws of nature that describe how nature will work, regardless of who you are, you know, anywhere in the universe, these laws are going to obtain, right? Um, okay, that's fine. Uh, but when it comes to the sciences that deal with people, like the social sciences or medicine, we probably want to uh, maybe um, be a little bit less point of view independent. You know, imagine you're a sociologist studying um, the effects of... Um, you know the the effects upon some marginalized community yeah. or or if you're an anthropologist who's trying to understand like an uncontacted people so you live amongst them and you learn their ways you kind of need their point of view right um so point of view independence i think is 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 good in certain sciences but in others we need to maybe uh not be afraid to be less objective so another idea another uh so that's the epistemic notion of objectivity the other is metaphysical um when we say when we're talking about metaphysical objectivity we're saying like look what science is doing is it's showing us the way the world really is right because the metaphysics remember metaphysics is the study of reality so science if you're if you're all about this metaphysical objectivity you believe science tells us how the world really is so feminist epistemologists criticize objectivity uh they they say look there's cases of bad science uh where the research just wasn't objective can you name some examples 
of bad scientists, uh, bad science. Now, earlier when I said sometimes we need to be less objective, I did not mean we need to do bad science. I said, or what I meant was that we need to we need to be aware of certain points of view some of the time, right? Like if I'm a sociologist and I'm studying the mental health effects of homelessness, I need to adopt their point of view, the point of view of my participants, right? But then there are cases where, um, you know, maybe uh, a lack of objectivity results in uh, poor scientific uh, understanding. Yeah. Chloe, good one. And speaking of that, oh, Remy says an important part in this interpretation of results obtained through science. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You're right, Remy. It's the whole scientific method, uh, not just the experimental part. That's a very good point. But what Chloe says, you just reminded me of something, Chloe. Um, so when I was young, there were far fewer people with autism and ADHD diagnoses, uh, diagnoses. And the ones that were, were almost all boys. Now, you don't have to out yourself if you don't want to. But I'm sure that you'll be aware that there are, number one, a heck of a lot more diagnoses of autism spectrum disorders and ADHD nowadays. There seems to be a higher incidence of diagnosis. Not only that, there are a lot more women on the spectrum and a lot more women with ADHD nowadays. Is that because there weren't any women with autism or ADHD in the 90s when I was a little kid? No. It means that science scientists were actually doing a pretty bad job of understanding who can have these conditions. The syphilis experiment case. Amy, uh, is that with the Tuskegee Airmen? Is that the one you're talking about? The, the Tuskegee pilots? I'm not sure if we're talking about the same case, but with the Tuskegee um, Airmen, they were an, an all-black um, American... Um, I don't know what, what you call it, unit uh, within the Air Force. Um, <clears throat> and they were um, experimented on without their informed consent. But yeah, okay, so late diagnosed ADHD. Yeah, that's right. It doesn't present the same way in women. Neither do autism spectrum conditions. And so when I was young, it was thought that, well, only boys get these. Um, but no, women get them too, but they don't present the same way, as you say. Yeah. Yeah, and that's true. Yeah, that's right, Kaya. Yeah, no, no, I mean, I know what you're saying. Um, when I was a kid, uh, there were, there were the autistic kids who were, um, like nonverbal, like more or less obviously autistic. Um, but the kid who, um, you know, maybe just was a bit of a loner, a bit of a class weirdo, what they would later call Asperger's. And then, of course, Asperger's then gets subsumed into uh, autism spectrum condition. Um, those, uh, it was, it's very easy for people to fall through the cracks, or it was very easy. And of course, the barriers to di to getting a diagnosis as an adult are quite high unless you have money. Which is why, uh, from what I understand, people uh, on the spectrum are generally pretty. Um, amenable to the idea of self-diagnosis. Um, self-diagnosis in many cases turns out to be accurate. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, you probably have a, a one or two of your professors who were in that situation, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, that's right, Kaya. It, there can be bio biases for the professional diagnoses. Um, but I know people, yeah, like, uh, yeah, I know people who, um, you know, they, they grow up, they have children and their children have autism or ADHD, and then they kind of self-diagnose. They go, oh, okay, so this makes it, a lot of things make sense for me as well, right? Um, so, um... Yeah, it's true. Like, uh, you know, if you're officially like I worked very briefly once uh, at the um, at uh, the um, safe, safer consumption site. And one of the nurses there was on the spectrum. And uh, she was telling us how um, they wouldn't let her adopt. She would try to adopt a cat from this adoption agency and they wouldn't let her do it. And she's like, come on, dude, like I'm a nurse. I work. You know, she was very clever, very intelligent, very professional, worked a job, doing better than a lot of quote unquote neurotypical folks are. Um, come on, let her have a cat, man. Yeah. Yeah, I will share a story. When I was uh, in an undergrad... Through a series of events, and please stop me if this is too self-indulgent, um, a series of events led to a recommendation for an assessment for me when I got to grad school. So I did. I was very disappointed in how the process unfolded. It was one day of cognitive testing, like a whole day of cognitive testing. Um, then... A couple of meetings with the psychologist, no more than a f three hours throughout the entire process. Uh, a couple of questionnaires at home. I didn't have to pay out of pocket, which was nice. But at the end of the day, Psychologist says, oh, I don't think that you are on the spectrum because you have a girlfriend. And I was just like, what? What? Huh? Because I knew of, uh, of neurodivergent people who were partnered. Uh, and I just thought that is such a, like, really? And it kind of... Um, made me lose faith in in the process and i don't to this day i don't know what my deal is i i honestly don't i know that i'm the kind of guy who goes and becomes a philosophy professor <laughs> but there's you know a failure of objectivity i think you know a failure of objectivity because there were other things that might have you know i thought i was supposed to get assessed for like uh a few different things you know and instead Okay, we're going to check for what, again, at the time, what they called Asperger's. They would check for this. Oh, girlfriend? No. Okay, bye. And I'm like, but what about all the other stuff? And and I just didn't hear back from him. So I had a really bad experience with, with trying to get an assessment. Um, Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, April, I saw your jaw hitting the floor. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, Chloe, I get it. Yeah, and Kai, good point. Good point. I mean, who is really neurotypical? Really? Who doesn't have something going on? I'm not saying like, oh, everyone's a little on the spectrum or a little. I'm not saying that. I'm saying find me someone who doesn't have a developmental condition or a mental health problem at some point in their lives. Right. All this is to say, um, I think the feminist epistemologists are quite right to question the notion of objectivity. It's not like science shouldn't be objective. It's that a lot of times it's just not. 
right? And when it needs to be focused more on the subject, it fails sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. So that's the lesson in my little spiel. Don't worry, though. I'm okay. Um, I'm fine. Um, uh, but, you know, story time it, it just tells you that, um, you know, sometimes those people that we think can be very objective, uh, you know, we're all human. And this is why we have science, right? This is why... You know, science is objective because it's self-correcting, and uh, and and this is why. This is why um, the feminists have a point, certainly. Yeah, Ashlyn, another good point. Like, I think a lot of people expect that. Um, you know, everyone on the spectrum will be bad with people. I mean, I think, I think, I think it, the, you know, there's an analogy that learning social cues for someone on the spectrum is really like learning another language and people do do this. Right. Um, but whatever, right. I could go on uh, a couple other things. This fellow did was recommend that I read books that I told him I was already reading or had read. Um, so at the end of the day, I just don't think I was listened to. Right. And I don't know, again, I don't know the deal. This is not a therapy session. I don't know. I don't know the scoop of, of the brain, the, the, what's going on up there. But the lesson is that, uh, science sometimes fails to be as objective as it needs to be. And sometimes fails to be subjective when it ought to be rather than strictly objective so that's the moral of the story we'll try and finish this off next week um next week also uh we're gonna have a lecture on uh essay writing so i know we're going a bit over time here but um we're going to have an essay on uh, or an essay on lecture oh my god my brain we're going to have a lecture on essay writing blah and um, so maybe what we'll do is we'll have to push perception to the week after. And so next week we'll finish feminist epistemology. And then I will give you a lecture on your essay assignment because that is, you know, it's a ways away, but it, but it is coming up. Um, don't be scared. No, I mean, don't be scared. Um, April says, uh, yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. And people also, you know, think of it as like a, a, a line, like a continuum. And it's not. It's more like I've heard the analogy of a of a mixing board, you know, like uh, and you can turn up this dial or this dial and you can turn all these dials up and down. It's really more like that. Right. So Ashlyn, for example, you know, if you're great with uh, people, you know, your people dial might be turned up, but I don't know somebody's uh sensory dial could be turned down right or or perhaps too high right um anyway uh <laughs> this is fun i wish we could just keep talking about this but it's time to go so um i will see you all next week we'll just finish our discussion of feminist epistemology and then i'm going to tell you all about the essay assignment don't be scared of the essay assignment yeah <laughs> yeah what we need is a 12-sided die. Wouldn't that be crazy for everybody, though? Like, if you could just, when you're, okay, I got to go to work, roll, oh, sick, I rolled a 10 in uh, intellect. So it's going to be a really good lecture today, right? Um, okay, I'll see you all next time. Have a good weekend, and um, yeah, take care. Bye for now. Oh, how many words the essay? Well, don't worry about that. It's going to be, I think I've got 12 to 1500, but I'll, we'll, we'll go through all of this uh, next week. So, you know, don't, don't worry too much, Jeremiah. Okay. Thanks everyone. Bye for now.